I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom all paternity in heaven and on earth is named. And we heard, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus unto all generations, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. A railway worker lay at death's door in the Padua Hospital. For more than 40 years, this worker had not approached the sacraments, and he would not hear of it now. The sisters sent for Father Leopoldo. He died in 1942, and he's now canonized. But the priest was rudely repulsed. He did not lose heart. But with the faith that procures miracles, he prayed and made others pray to Our Lady, refuge of sinners. Next day, the patient complained that that little friar was always before his eyes and asked that he be sent for again. Full of joy, Father Leopoldo, a Capuchin friar, came and reconciled him to God. He lived on another five days, demanding that Father Leopoldo should constantly be with him and saying, he is an angel, that little friar. Last week, we discussed, we reflected on the exaggerated or unhealthy clericalism that led to the scandals we've had to endure over these last decades. Today, let's seek to understand, in some ways, a healthy clericalism. His Majesty, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, promised to love us to the end. Having loved his own, it says in St. John's Gospel, who were in the world, he loved them unto the end. He loves us by giving us priests, by giving us a way to share in his one eternal priesthood and its infinite sacrifice, by giving us a way to make a connection with heaven, an assured, guaranteed connection to heaven. The Kyrie of ours once exclaimed, after God, the priest is everything. Only in heaven will he fully realize what he is. Were we to realize fully what a priest is on earth, we would die. Not of fright, but of love. Without the priest, the passion and death of our Lord would be of no avail. It is the priest who continues the work of redemption on earth. Curie of ours, thank you. Yes, it is the priest who continues this work even unto the very end of time. In the church, unto generations, unto generations, to the end. As His Majesty taught us just before ascending into heaven, He said, Behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. How? In and through His priests. Inasmuch as they do what the church does. Inasmuch as they fulfill their duties of their state in life. Will Christ always be with us? Thus we have the Mass. We have the sacraments. After much experience, St. Anthony Mary Claret noted this. The Protestants, the Communists, and the Socialists know that their greatest enemies, the ones most likely to thwart their designs, are the Catholic priests. Since their errors are from the prince of darkness, it suffices for priests to present to the people the light of the Catholic doctrine in order to dissipate all the darkness caused by their erroneous tenets. All the priest need do is do his duties and he will fight these people. No matter what happens, he will be fighting them. Even if he doesn't will directly to fight them, he will by doing his duties. St. Anthony Ray Claret, he goes on. Their most subtle and strategic move, therefore, has been to spread evil of the priests of the church, to discredit the priests, to get rid of the priests. That's what the communists, the Protestants, and the socialists have sought to do. St. Anthony Mary Claret, thank you. Now, it's no secret that in these times, the sacred priesthood of our Lord and Savior is under a heavy attack in a variety of ways, both from within, self-inflicted wounds, and from without. Not to mention numerous dismal failures of many unfaithful priests. 
But as St. Augustine says so well, the sheep have no obligation to shed their own skins just because the wolves sometimes use them for disguise. The Curie of ours rightly pointed out that when one wishes to destroy religion, to destroy the church, one begins by attacking the priest. St. Pius X said, Sicut sacerdos, sic populos. As the priests, so the people. These present priest scandals, huh? Surely there are, is a clear sign that the church is indeed in her own passion tied. She's been betrayed. She's being misrepresented. She's being attacked. Nevertheless, we must maintain course in this dark time unto the end. And this requires willy nilly. You can't do without it. It requires the priesthood and a healthy clericalism. Once when the 19th century, once again, St. Anthony Mary Claret was a simple mission preacher in the midst of a sermon to an immense and attentive crowd in a town plaza, the church would not hold him. Everybody was listening, but all were shocked to hear the rude shout of a mule trainer driver who had just entered one of the bordering streets. He yelled out, how about a little water for the preacher who must be good and dry? Seems the man did not like what he was hearing. Not hard to imagine. Unperturbed, unperturbed by this mockery, Padre Anthony digressed from his theme only long enough to quiet his congregation's indignation and prevent any retaliation. Let it go, my brother, as he counseled. All too soon, this poor man and his animals are going to see entirely too much water. Following this enigmatic comment, he returned to his sermon while the unchallenged muleteer continued on his way. But within a day or two, the town learned that the poor man and his beasts had all been drowned in the Saras River. Returning to our Capuchin friar, St. Leopoldo, this man, he was small in stature and not the most handsome. He was on his way home from the Basilica of St. Anthony in Padua. The year was 1935. Nearing a bridge over a canal, he was met by some young hotheads, smart Alex, who jeered at him saying, let's take the old boy and chuck him in the canal. He looked at him and said, go ahead and try. And he went along his way even slowed down to give him a chance. In due course, walking slowly, he went some distance, but turned to retrace his steps, only to find these same boys still there like so many statues, unable to move, frozen in their place. As he approached, they were able to throw themselves on their knees, beg his forgiveness. Don't ask any forgiveness from me, he said kindly. It's God's forgiveness, you should ask. I'm only a poor friar, but you must learn to respect people, particularly God's ministers. Then he gave them a friendly clap on the shoulder and let them go. The same saint always reacted very strongly to any denigration of priests, even when it was a matter of notoriety. Interesting, huh? This is a saint. He could see into people's souls. They would go to confession to him like Padre Pio. He could see into their souls and tell them their sins. He could look off into the distance and see future events. He was a saint. He knew about these priests and he would always say, let God judge. Let's not get involved in all this talk. I relate these stories to you because it shows how God is not pleased when his priests are mocked, they're scorned, they're attacked. What a precarious and shameful place we are now in today. God's displeasure, the reason for this is simple. The priest, the bishop, the pope all participate in the one fatherhood of God, in the one priesthood of Jesus Christ, and in the one source of authority that comes from God. As a result, a reproach aimed at them cannot help but touch upon God Himself. 
When a priest is ordained, his soul is reordered to Christ. His very being is altered. His personality changes. This is one reason why we called the sacrament holy order. It is about reordering the soul. It is the ordained, the reordered soul of the priest that is enabled to act in persona Christi capitis, in person of Christ ahead. By a kind of surrender of his own personality, the priest puts his whole being at the disposal of God. Thus, the priest must strive to say and do only what God wants, to do what the church does. Thus, what we spoke of last Sunday. The more he surrenders himself to God and his church, the more Christ is present to us through him. And this is why we must pray hard for our priests and support them to help them do that very thing. With such an intimate participation in the priesthood of Christ, we know with the greatest assurance that the ordained priest can make direct connections with heaven through the sacraments. Grace from heaven descends to us through the sacraments as through a pipeline with various valves. It is the priesthood, the ordained minister of God, is enabled to open the valves. No one else can open them. It has to be the priest. He has to be there. Again, St. John Vianney, he says, the priest holds the key to the treasures of heaven. It is he who opens the door. He is the steward of the good Lord, the administrator of his goods. Listen again to St. Leopoldo. When I say mass, my thoughts are for all who have consulted me. At the culmination of the sacred mysteries, I fold them all in my heart and I know that my prayers will be answered because what I ask for is nothing compared to what I offer. I'm offering the Lord, the Son to the Father at Calvary. The priesthood is like a radio tower that both receives and transmits on a heavenly frequency that only God knows and responds to. And he loves this frequency. He loves to listen because it is of his son. No other religion has this radio tower or knows this heavenly wavelength. How essential is the priesthood? We would not have such a connection to heaven without it. Furthermore, the priest in good standing is endowed with a participation in the one fatherhood of God. And this is why we call him father. If he's in good standing, has the faculties, we should call him father. He's been ordained to be a participant in the one fatherhood of God. And yet we can fulfill that injunction of his majesty, right? Call none your father on earth, for one is your father who is in heaven. In other words, the priest participates in the one fatherhood of God. We should always insist on calling the priest father while avoid calling him any unbecoming names or titles. I know my grandfather, when I was ordained, he was 88 years old. And from that very day, he always called me father. Furthermore, we must recognize that we can never really be an equal to a priest. Just as a father of a family can never be equal to his children, And this means too much familiarity with the priest can be detrimental to him as well as to us. Third of all, if we have the teaching of our Lord, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We have this teaching. All authority has been given to Christ and he gives it to us. The first thing to understand about authority is that it is one. It's not many. There's only one author, in other words. One author of life, one author of grace, one author of power in the world, and that author is God. If any authority is to be exercised, it must come from him. Even if it is to be used by evil men and devils, it can only be allowed by God. Recall the profound words of his majesty to Pilate, thou shouldest not have any power against me unless... It were given thee from above, from the author himself. 
Consider a scene from the life of St. Norbert. Maybe I've told you this one before, but it's worth repeating. On more than one occasion, the devil tried to attack him as he was performing an exorcism. On one particular occasion, a possessed girl grabbed his stole and was going to choke him with it. Those present tried to restrain her. He said, no, let her go. If she has received the power from God, let her do what she can. When she heard this, she released him on on her own. No one forced her. There's only one author, one authority in the world with various levels of participation and permissions. Thus, we have to ask ourselves, with all the scandals that are going on, these were somehow permitted. Thus, the reason for the first sermon I gave, why was it permitted? Because we have forgotten God, that's why. We have erased our memory. We refuse to go back and do what we used to do and think as we used to think. And we are being punished for it. And second of all, we have forgotten how to do our duties of our state in life. Priests no longer do their duties. Thus, we're being punished. And it has been permitted by God. And it's a horrible punishment, a shameful punishment, a harrowing punishment. Nobody likes it. Well, let's wake up. Let's do the right thing now. It's time. God has chosen to exercise His authority through the sacrament of holy orders and the sacred power it bestows. Thus, the Pope is only the vicar of Christ. He's not autonomous. He can only work within the bounds of which Christ has endowed him. He too has limits. And he's the highest personages on earth. And he has limits and boundaries. He's only the vicar. And wouldn't it be harrowing to be in the judgment if you have gone beyond them? To have such responsibility and to abuse it. The Pope is only the vicar of Christ on earth, meaning all authority in the church comes to us through Christ, from Christ, through the Pope and the bishops and the priests united to him. It is hierarchical. It's unavoidable. Even when the Pharisees or Sadducees were doctrinally in error, his majesty remains respectful. But at the same time, he always proclaimed the whole truth, come what may, Our Lord did not ever tolerate error. He fought it. He corrected it. Thus, we are always allowed to correct error and prevent scandals, but not by attacking, belittling, and smearing the priests and prelates of the church, even if they deserve it. Let's let God take care of that. When our Lord did call the Pharisees' names, calling them, in their stubbornness, whitewashed tombs. He did so to their face, not on some blog. When St. Catherine corrected priests and popes, she always showed respect for their holy order and their office. Then she told them the mistakes they were making in a fitting way. As someone who was enlightened by God and worked miracles regularly to prove it. Yes, there is many a Judas today. Yes, there are repeated failures, numerous attacks from unfaithful priests. But we must and we should never lose our love for the priesthood. And in our love and zeal for the priesthood, we must guard ourselves from the mistake of attacking priests, bishops and popes themselves, but rather only address their error, the error of their ways and their teachings. St. Pius X put it like this, fight error without touching the individual. St. John Vianney, he said, after God, the priest is everything. Only in heaven will he fully realize what he is. Were we to realize fully what a priest is on earth, we would die, not of fright, but of love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.